today uh, what we'll be uh, talking about is ABA and autism. Um, and so uh, for a lot of people, they actually don't know what ABA is. So we're going to talk a little bit about ABA and uh, how um, its use in uh, the treatment of children with autism. Now, uh, ABA is one of thousands, literally thousands of treatments for kids with autism. Okay? And that's uh, the one real distinguishing feature about ABA and kids with autism is that it's research-based and that there's a lot of evidence for its use. There are literally thousands of uh, interventions. You know, you can, you can type into Google, you can find a wide variety of interventions uh, for children with autism. And uh, the thing is that ABA, and specifically the um, type of ABA intervention that we'll be talking about, um, is the only one that has a lot of research behind it that demonstrates its efficacy. So no other research out there or no other treatment out there has demonstrated the efficacy as well as the uh, effectiveness of ABA in helping um, uh, young children with autism. So the specific type of ABA uh, intervention that we're going to be talking about is early intensive behavior intervention. The original study by uh, Lovas in, um, the, that got started in the 60s and 70s uh, was applying uh, applied behavior analysis to young children with autism. That's children that started under the age of four. And they provided 40 hours a week of ABA treatment to those kids. What they found was that 47% um, of those kids that got this type of treatment achieved typical functioning. So the very goals of early intensive behavior intervention is not just making progress with the child. It is about making enough progress to help all kids achieve normal academic and intellectual functioning. So, uh, so that's really the goal of ABA is to help every child reach a specific level of functioning, you know, and the ultimate goal for every child is being able to live a life like any other child, you know, and to um, be able to go to school, make friends, to do all those things regular kids are able to do. So numerous studies uh, have been uh, conducted afterwards that have uh, confirmed uh, the uh, original um, results of that first study. Now, other treatments may uh, say that they help kids with autism, you know, and uh, certain portions of ABA are helpful to kids with autism. But a specifically early intensive behavior intervention the goal is not just to help. It's not just to make progress. It's not just to um, improve a child's life a little bit. The goal is to really get kids to be like other kids. Now, um, what's really important here is to understand all the different mechanics or the different underlying um, uh, structure that enabled uh, all of these type of success stories to occur. So um, the research is done on young kids under the age of four, okay? and they gave these kids on average 40 hours a week of ABA treatment. And treatment focused on reducing all of their inappropriate behaviors and teaching them all the skills that they would need to function in their homes, in their communities, and in their schools. So the treatment itself was comprehensive, meaning that it looked at all of the child's skill deficits, like whatever they were missing in terms of um, being able to learn, being able to um, uh, uh, build on skill sets and do all of those kind of things. Um, and it taught everything that they would need to know. Now, I think uh, most people would not understand that, oh, if my child's older or 
um, there are other conditions or other factors that come into play, like, oh, will ABA be able to be helpful for my child? And the short answer to that really is that, oh, ABA is effective across the board for a, for a wide variety of uh, kids, from kids that are nonverbal to the kids that have um, verbal skills to um, kids that don't know how to do anything in the beginning to kids that already have some skill sets to them. So ABA is effective across the board, across all of these kids. Then the thing is, is that as you kind of get older, the uh, opportunities for achieving the typical functioning are a little bit harder to achieve. You know, that, oh, you have the highest rate of success the younger that you generally start with the kids. All kids benefit from ABA. Then when you take a look at each individual kid, then how much ABA benefits that child ranges um, from uh, significantly in terms of, oh, helping these kids get to typical functioning to, oh, helping them be able to live more independently, giving them some of those type of skills. But at the individual level, how much it helps varies. So all kids benefit from ABA, but again, all of the research in early intensive behavior intervention is outcome-based research, which means that, oh, after you give these kids the 40 hours a week um, of intensive services, where do these kids end up? Where do they go, you know? And that's really the most important thing to take away from ABA is that, oh, this is the only treatment out there that actually has research that shows like, oh, when you give this treatment to these kids, 47% of those kids will achieve normal function. So now that we've talked about ABA, Let's transition and talk a little bit about autism so that we all are talking about the same things. Autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disorder. Okay? That means that it's a um, problem that affects kids as they um, grow. The diagnosis of autism is made by medical doctors and psychologists. In order for a doctor or a psychologist to diagnose a child, the child has to meet certain specific criteria, certain specific symptoms in order to qualify for that diagnostic. Now, the symptoms and the description of those symptoms are based on the International Classification of Diseases or what is commonly known as the ICD, and um, that's version 10. Now, as far as the actual diagnosis, we won't get into that um, because it's a little bit more complicated. It's a lot more technical. We won't be getting into the details of exactly what a doctor or a psychologist needs to diagnose a child. Instead, what we're going to really talk about is what is autism and how does ABA see autism? So the question then is, what is autism? You know, like, what is it, okay? And I think um, that's something that a lot of people um, grapple with in terms of like, oh, really understanding what it is. So autism is a spectrum disorder, okay? And so what a spectrum disorder means that it has a wide diversity of symptomology associated with a, a big breadth of um, uh, how many different versions of autism there might be out there from kids that are completely nonverbal to kids that have good ver verbal skills. So the diversity in the kids with autism is what makes diagnosing autism challenging. Now, the thing about uh, autism is, is that because it's a spectrum disorder, and there's a wide variety of symptoms within the scope of that disorder, then um, it's based off of the child's history. You know, oh, they have to have 
a certain number of symptomology that leads to this before the age of three. But the thing is, is that, oh, you know, for, um, hold on for a second. Let me uh, gather my thoughts here. Um, unlike a lot of other medical conditions, you know, like, oh, tuberculosis or sickle cell anemia, right? unlike other medical conditions, there's no medical test for autism. Okay. There's no like, oh, let me do blood work and it comes back positive or it comes back negative. And for sure, oh, you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. You know, there's no kind of gray area. In autism, there's a wide variety, a wide range of gray area. Okay. And it's because there is no absolute like, oh, for sure, this test tells you this ha your kid has autism versus your kid does not have autism. So at the end of the day, then, what autism is, is a diagnostic label that helps clinicians, based on a set of criteria, say, oh, this kid has this. Ultimately, autism isn't something that's real. You know, it's not real in the sense that, oh, I have this particular disorder. Autism is a label for a group of symptoms that doctors and psychologists have agreed upon, oh, this, you need this amount of symptoms in order to qualify for this diagnosis. And the number of symptoms has evolved and changed over the years. And it's the negotiation between professionals that work with this population that ultimately then decides on, oh, you need this level to be considered to have autism. And if you don't meet that level, then you don't have autism. But that level has changed over the years and it's constantly evolving, which means that, oh, well, what is autism? Well, autism now is just a label for a group of symptoms that are occurring together, but it's not something real. It's not something that, oh, I have black hair, you know, like it's not, so fixed. So, um, so the, the reason I like to tell all parents about this being a label is that when you treat it as real, there's going to be things that you do that will accidentally reinforce your beliefs. Okay. And there's a lot of times like, oh, when you believe something to be real, you treat it as real. And then when you treat it as real, you make it even more real. Now, when you see something as real, then what happens is like, oh, I know my child has autism. Okay. My child has autism. So when they engage in behaviors, when they engage in especially inappropriate behaviors, it's easy for us to say, oh, that's the autism. Okay, oh, that's just part of their condition, part of who they are. So I can't change that. There's nothing I can do about it because that's who they are. That's what their makeup is, okay? But the thing is, like, we are all a byproduct of how we're the family that we're born into, along with all of the experiences in our life that shape us to be the way that we are. And that when you take a look at kids with autism, all of their behaviors are learned behaviors. They learn to do things. They learn that these things are very effective at getting the things that they want. And so you cannot see this as a real thing because the more you see it as real, the more you're gonna excuse them for doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And then on the other side of it, you're not gonna expect them to learn things. You're not going to expect them to behave in appropriate ways. And it's a very slippery slope for you to be able to, oh, here's autism, and I'm going to try to uh, treat you not like a child with autism, you know? And, um, but that's actually the, one of the most important things for you to do is to get rid of that as a, like, as a true thing that oh that it actually exists 
because then when you see it as real, you're going to behave as it, as if it's real, then you're going to do all of those things accidentally. That's going to keep the child in the exact same place. We recently had uh, an experience uh, in the U.S. where one of our clients, we've been trying to get him uh, our help in school. And the uh, principal or the special ed coordinator of that school emailed us and told us like, oh, well, he's a child with autism. You should expect him to flap his hands. You know, you should, that's who he is, you know, and that's never going to change. <laughs> but if you take a look at our history with him, where he started, he was hand flapping a lot and we taught him not to hand flap as much and he was much better about doing that and across all of the situations that used to bother him across a lot of uh, uh, skill sets he learned to um, function more typically you know the problem is, is that oh in that setting then for somebody that oh thinks that this is a part of who they are, they're not going to address it. They're going to allow it to happen. When they allow it to happen, it's gonna happen more frequently. And then it, it does create the problems itself. Oh, my belief that you have autism, nothing's gonna change, everything's gonna remain the same. Well, yes, for sure, everything's gonna remain the same with that mindset. So how should you look at this child? You know. So what you really want to do is like, this is a very unique child that has strengths and weaknesses that are different from other kids. And so there are weaknesses to how they interact, there are weaknesses to their skill sets, there's weaknesses. And so our job then is to strengthen those weaknesses, to give them skills, to uh, help them cope with different situations and that that's what our goal is is like oh we're going to identify these strengths and weaknesses and really work on addressing those weaknesses so that they can overcome those so when you're taking a look at um, kids with autism then what we're, what aba is looking at is their excesses and their deficits what do they do more than other kids and what do they, are they um, lacking? What are the skills that they're missing or they're de delayed in relative to other kids? The behaviors that children with autism demonstrate are going to be the exact same behaviors that most kids are going to engage in. The only real difference is in the degree that they demonstrate it, when they demonstrate it, how long they demonstrate it, but the actual behaviors themselves are demonstrated by every single child. All kids will cry. All kids will scream. All kids will throw a tantrum. Kids aggress, you know, kids uh, run away. Kids don't listen. All kids engage in those type of behaviors. But it's in the degree that the kids do it. Whereas like with a regular developing child, they might protest over, oh, I don't get something that I really want. For a child with autism, it might be as simple as, oh, you're making a right instead of a left on the street. And that results in a hour long protest that escalates in terms of its behaviors. And another act excess that most kids with autism demonstrate um, is self-stimulatory behaviors. So these behaviors include rocking, flapping their hands, uh, walking on tiptoes, um, you know, playing with objects, but just spinning those objects, watching fans spin repeatedly. Just remember that these behaviors regular developing kids demonstrate these behaviors as well. You can l put a regular child in a room that has no toys, nothing to play with, and very shortly after, they'll start licking the walls because there's nothing else for them to do. 
the thing is, is that for kids with autism, many of them don't know how to play. They don't know how to play with toys. They don't know how to play with peers. They don't know how to play with imagination. So they can't pretend something is something else, which means that they're bored for a good portion of their day. And so when they engage in these self-stimulatory behaviors, that's better than being bored. And that's the situation generally that you have is that, oh, similar to the regular developing kid put in a room that nothing to do, they'll start to engage in these type of behaviors. That's a condition that we see in the kids, which is like they don't have other appropriate skills to engage in. And rather than being bored, they're going to engage in these self-stimulatory type of behaviors. Regular developing children start to learn at a very young age when the things that they do might be embarrassing, might be shameful. So as they get older, what happens is that they might engage in these same self-stimulatory behaviors, but they learn very quickly, oh, everybody thinks this is really weird. And I'm going to be made fun of if I do these. And so as we grow up, we learn to get rid of these behaviors that might be embarrassing in public, or we learn, oh, I will only engage in these behaviors in the privacy of my own home. What happens then is that we all learn to do all of our weird things, and the only people that really know about the weird things that we do are usually our closest family members. So we've learned to hide all of those behaviors that are that we still do, but only our closest relatives, our closest uh, friends know that we do those kind of things. A child with autism does not have any of those qualms. They are not worried about how it looks to other people. They don't care what it looks to other people. They're likely to do it in the middle of a busy store. They're likely to do it anywhere if it gets them the things that they want. So they will tantrum, they will scream, they will yell, they will throw things, they will uh, engage in a wide variety of behaviors if they can get what they want. And if what I do embarrasses you as a parent, then I know I'm more likely to get what I want to get, to get you to give in to me. Because be, once you are embarrassed, then you want me to stop doing what I'm doing. Guess what? In order to stop, then you have to give me what I want. And so that's the power all of these behaviors generally have over parents is that, oh, it controls you. It Oh, the threat of me engaging in these behaviors in public gets you to give in to what I want. Therefore, the most important thing in terms of looking at all these behavioral excesses from the tantrums to the aggression to running away to not listening to us is making sure the child does not get what they're looking for when they engage in these behaviors. So if the child screams because they want your attention, you have to minimize the attention you give to that behavior. If they hit because they want an ice cream, you have to make sure they don't get that ice cream when they hit. If they rip up paper because they don't want to do work, you have to make sure they complete the work so that the behavior doesn't allow the child to get it is what um, they're looking for by engaging in that behavior. So when we're looking at all of these behaviors, then ABA directly addresses all of these type of behaviors for reduction, trying to get rid of these, because all of these behaviors serve to interfere with the child learning, interfere with them actually being happy. Because you can't actually be happy when you're protesting and you're screaming and we're engaging in a, all of these behaviors. So we've talked about 
excesses and all the behavior excesses that kids with dem uh, kids with autism demonstrate. So we're going to shift gears. We're going to talk about deficits. Oh, what are kids missing or lacking or they're delayed in relative to other children? One of the biggest deficits is intolerance. Okay, being able to tolerate a wide variety of different situations. So you have um, kids that are um, have a very, very limited diet. Oh, I only eat eggs, or I only eat this. And that different textures, different um, flavors, different types of food, they are completely resistant to eating. They might be extremely intolerant to wearing different types or articles of clothing. Specific textures of clothing may bother them. The tags on the back of shirts might bother them. Oh, they have to wear this particular type of outfit or, oh, I can only wear the color blue or only wear this color. There are very, very um, strong rigidities in those type of situations. A lot of kids are sensitive to different types of sounds or different lighting conditions. You know, uh, so uh, fluorescent lighting and the, the blinking that occurs with that bothers them. Oh, specific sounds for specific locations might bother them. And so they might, oh, plug up their ears, they cover their ears, and uh, they react um, uh, by protesting or engaging in a wide variety of maladaptive behaviors when they're put into those type of situations. Some of the kids that we worked with, Parents had to wait until they fell asleep to cut their nails or to cut their hair. Uh, they had to do a lot of things to, oh, be able to uh, get them to eat medicine or whatnot. They've had to do various things. Oh, I had to cut a pill, then had to grind it up, and then I have to put it in some sort of food that uh, they can't taste the medicine in there. They have to do a wide variety of different things to um, get their child just to be able to do certain things, you know? And so um, that's uh, extremely challenging on a day-to-day -day basis of, oh, how much you have to accommodate um, for this type of intolerance. And so that's what ABA does, is ABA directly addresses their lack of frustration tolerance, and it teaches them to cope with a wider variety of situations. So kids that, oh, are, uh, have uh, extremely limited diets, we get them to be able to eat a wide variety of foods, including fruits and vegetables and uh, those type of things. We get them to be able to wear any article of clothing, be able to tolerate getting haircuts, getting their hair washed, whatever situation that they are sensitive to and have a really challenging time uh, doing on a regular basis, ABA addresses all of those so that they can lead a normal, healthy, happy life. Now, the other areas of deficit include um, an inability to communicate. You know, so they generally, oh, they can't, they don't point to things that they want. They can't communicate effectively with other people in terms of letting them know, oh, this is something that I want. So an effective ABA program then specifically teaches them skills to effectively communicate, whether it's by pointing at things that they want, nodding or shaking their heads to indicate yes or no, asking for things nicely, or giving a picture of the thing that they want over to somebody else. And that way they're communicating to somebody else what they want if they don't have the vocal ability to do so. Like all kids, Kids with autism need to be taught to do a lot of self-help and self-care related things like dressing themselves, brushing their teeth, washing their hands. Unlike regular developing kids, regular developing kids, they might learn those things a little bit on their own. They see parents do it or they see their siblings do it and then they're trying to copy it. Whereas the kids that we work with, they need to be taught explicitly how to do things, the techniques, the very um, steps that they need to do in order to accomplish these self-help skills. One of the biggest impacts in terms of the deficits that affect kids with autism is this lack 
a good imitation skill. And most kids with autism don't have imitation skills whatsoever. So they have a hard time learning because they lack this specific skill set. Another deficit that most kids with autism have is a language delay. And some kids are completely mute. Other kids just repeat words or phrases that they heard, but they don't know how to use language effectively to communicate, to um, share experiences. ABA specifically targets every aspect of language to teach kids to understand the most, most basic components of language, and then it builds on that skill set until they can learn and interact and listen like other children can. So eye contact is another major deficit. And eye contact, they can actually even track in very young babies that are likely to have autism. They can use sophisticated tracking material, uh, machinery, and they can actually track a child's eye movement. And they can find that, oh, at very, very young ages, kids that will eventually develop autism or um, get this diagnosis of autism have this deficit very, very early in life. And social skills development is also a large deficit in kids with autism. They don't know how to interact with other kids, with adults. They don't know how to play and build relationships with other people because they have a hard time sharing experiences and um, uh, doing those small little things like, oh, reading other people's emotions and adapting their behaviors to how others feel. They cannot do that. And so then what happens is that they don't build relationships because of this lack of connectivity with other people. So ABA targets these deficits in their language and in their social skills development. They, you can teach a child to answer questions, to ask questions, to um, understand uh, more complex um, statements, uh, to overcome these deficits. So ABA is the only research-based treatment that has demonstrated that they can get kids that have this diagnosis to a level of functioning that professionals, when they assess them, they cannot tell the difference between this child and a regular developing child. And that's the only treatment available that has that level of research. So a lot of parents actually ask me like, oh, you know, um, there's this experimental treatment out there. Should I try it or should I not? And the rationale is like, oh, well, ABA was an experimental treatment back in the 60s and 70s when it was first utilized with kids with autism. And then they found these tremendous results why shouldn't I go ahead with some sort of experimental treatment today? What I tell them is the difference between now and the 60s and 70s is that in the 60s and 70s, when they first started using ABA for kids with autism, there were no other options. There was not like a, oh, you know what? This also has effectiveness with this group. In the 60s and 70s, most kids either ended up in institutional care where they got sent to hospitals and they just stayed in the hospitals 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or one family member would essentially sacrifice their life and stay with the child at home to always take care of them. And that was really the only option available. So if you have a choice between, oh, you know what? We're looking at institutional care or like a family member is always going to be needing to be home to take care of this individual or this experimental treatment. It's understandable why, okay, you choose this experimental treatment. Nowadays, we have ABA, which is a proven treatment, something that has evidence behind what it states. So for me then, it's that, oh, you have to give 
ABA the chance to succeed. If it fails, then fine, go look for something more experimental. But if you're saying at the very onset, oh, I'm just going with the experimental treatment over ABA, that's risking a lot in terms of your child's future. The thing is that ABA works for all kids, regardless of whether they have autism or not. Okay? They work across the board. Every child will benefit from ABA treatment. Okay? Then the degree of how much they benefit ranges from one child to the other. With the idea that, oh, the more kids that you can start early and give them enough treatment, a good portion of them, 47%, will achieve typical function. Now, the thing is, is that, oh, even for the kids that don't achieve typical functioning, they learn skills, their behaviors subside, you know, their appropriate behaviors increase. And so I think future research and future um, treatment then needs to really look at the kids that don't achieve best outcome. They don't achieve typical functioning. And what do we need to do to help those kids and to increase that percentage of those kids meeting that standard? All right. Uh, so um, that's our presentation today about ABA and um, the treatment of children with autism. Uh, we uh, can open the floor up to any kind of questions that anybody might have. All right. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining in. I hope uh, this was helpful for everyone. And then I'll see everybody next time.